there are two different kinds of cognitive processes. There's one process which is automatic. So if you hear the word dog, you can't help but associating those sounds with the meaning for dog. It's just how your mind works. But there are other kinds of processes that are subject to something that's called cognitive control, which is, for example, how you focus your attention to solve a problem in the best way. So for, I can have a display where I have things that are same or different color, and your task is to press a button of the same color when I present something on a screen. Now, I can distract you by having the same colored things close to each other or in different parts of the display. And people get better at ignoring the spatial cues and concentrating on the correct color cues. The interesting thing is that it seems that bilinguals and multilinguals are better at this task, and the question is why. Judith Kroll and Ellen Bialystok have a hypothesis which says, look, we know that when you know more than one language, there's no way of just focusing on a single language at a time. So if you talk to me in French, and I also speak English, I'm still activating both my French and English systems. That means that bilinguals have to suppress the automatically activated language that's not in use in order to focus on the right language. What that means in general is that they're constantly exhibiting and engaging in cognitive control. So they get all of this practice so they get to be good at other tasks that involve the same functions. And that's why they're better than monolinguals. The first thing you have to do to identify people is you have to base how well they're going to do in foreign languages based on other cognitive skills. So we talked uh, in the last question about focusing attention, how many things you can hold in your memory, those kind of things that are, it turns out, under, can be made under your control. So in particular, Castle has identified a variety of these factors that are associated with your ability to leap to high-level language learning. These are things like how much can you hold in your memory at one time, how adept are you at focusing in on sound, so what's your auditory acuity, and how good are you at switching from task to task while remaining in focus. And this is along with many other factors. And we put all of these uh, tests for how good you are at these particular skills into a battery called the High Level Aptitude Battery, which is a test that can actually be used to select people who are going to be able to leap to the high level. The second thing that's important about identifying these people is that you need to have a metric for what it means to excel. When are we going to say that you're a high level of proficiency? And various of the language groups, the, a group called ACFL and the Interagency Language Roundtable, have established these standards so we can measure how close or far away a person is to actually reaching the summit. Previously, we didn't have cognitive models. So we just had to assess how well you were doing based on things that we observed in a kind of ad hoc way in the classroom. But now we're really zeroing in on the underlying mental components, which is a huge breakthrough in this field. I started out as a physics major, and I was interested in the rigor of physics. But then I became a philosophy major, and I read Descartes, and I was taken by the idea that you are shaped, the kind of languages that you can learn may be an inborn property of your mental makeup. So it's not that you can learn any possible language. What drew me to linguistics was in philosophy you couldn't get a precise way of testing that hypothesis. In linguistics we add to really interesting questions the rigor of a methodology for how to experimentally and behaviorally test these things out. 
In addition, I was a student at MIT, so I got hooked on the computer aspect, and I've applied what I know about human beings to develop machines who can, that can perform language tasks uh, in the same way that humans do. So CASEL, which is the organization I represent, is building in several directions. So first, we're identifying, as I've said, the cognitive components that underlie language growth and language ability. And we've done things like, you might think that some of those components, by the time you're an adult, well, they're just fixed, and what can you do? You have the working memory that you have, and you're stuck with it. Recent really exciting developments have shown that with about 20 hours of training on specific tasks, we can A, improve your working memory, B, that that improvement generalizes to other tasks, and C, that that improvement remains even up to three months after training. So we're trying to figure out what is it that language teachers should be concentrating on that they can train. Once you've figured out what you can train, now we're figuring out for each individual where are their weaknesses and can we apply specific training that's going to make you, the language learner, a particular language learner, do better. Um, and we're building that into the um, training and language learning that we give people. The last thing we're doing is trying to figure out, in a from a neuroscience perspective, what are the signatures and what are the characteristics of people's brains who do or do not possess these skills to a greater or lesser degree, both because that will allow us to identify them better, and second of all, to see learning and training to see the effects pretty directly.